Okay. Um, you know, I know Sunday I talked on um, Daniel 2, the man image, and went over that with um, Revelation 17 and um, put the, um, you know, tied Revelation 17 in with the heads of the beast. So I thought tonight we might try to finish that by tying some other scriptures together. So um, I'll go ahead and screen share. And uh, I think I got to take this over. Oh, what happened to my, hold on a minute. I'll see where my, Um, it looks like it may be because I'm not getting my just hold on a second maybe I'll do this There we go. Can y'all see that? Y'all see the whole thing? Um, So I'm in uh, the, excuse me. Yes, sir, we can see it. Okay, so I'm in the first chapter of uh, Joel. I thought I would maybe try to tie these, you know, we're we're dealing with from Daniel's time and Daniel too, we're dealing with Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then of course, in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, we, we tied in um, also the United States and the um, iron and clay in Daniel 2. And um, so we, we just tried to tie that together. And I put all the notes on our WhatsApp group page. Um, and then there was a question or two on there. So I, I gave it a little bit further explanation. So here tonight, I'm just going to try and maybe finish tying that up with, in the book of Joel, um, I'll just go ahead and read these first verses. It's the uh, first four verses. The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, you old men, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell you your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation that the palmer worm which have left uh, hath the locust eaten and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Well, he goes on and shows these worms, you know, are destroying worms and uh, so the palmer worm here is Babylon uh, in prophecy, and lo the locust is per Medo Persia, the canker worm is Greece, and the caterpillar Rome. I will post these this this note here also on our WhatsApp page. But 
we will tie we can tie that together with the same as the man image in Daniel 2 where the head of gold was Babylon the arms and breast of silver was Medo Persia the belly and thighs of brass was Greece the legs of iron was Rome the feet in of iron and clay equals United US which is Pentecostalism and Catholicism and Rome, U.S. and Rome. This is where the United States is a short-lived lived dragon and joins up with Rome, makes the image of the beast and causes the papacy to become the eighth head, <laughs> um, which these are the same as in Daniel 7. God just gives different pictures in each one of these illustrations are allegories, pictures. In Daniel 7, 4 through 8, the lion is Babylon, Medo-Persia. Uh, the bear is Medo-Persia. The leopard is Greece. And the dreadful beast and little horn is pagan and papal Rome. You remember there was a, he, he saw a dreadful beast, but he didn't know what it was. Uh, he just, that's why he just called it dreadful. And um, then, which was Rome, and then Papa Rome. Oh, let me, let me, I didn't realize my phone wasn't turned off. Okay, so um, so then <clears throat> if we go to the four horns in Zechariah 1. Uh, four, four carpenters and four horns. These four carpenters, I'll mention in a minute, they are, they are the same as the four um, they're the same as the four angels loosed out of the river Euphrates, which is uh, Pentecostalism, uh, I mean, Protestantism, Pentecostalism, and then uh, each one of these was loosed for 30, uh, for 360 years, 100 years, 30 years, and 15 years, the last prophetical hour. Each one of those are four carpenters that's rebuilding all what these four dragons destroyed. Um, he said, uh, then said I, what come these to do? And he spake and said, which have scattered Judah so that uh, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horns over the land of Judah to scatter it. So here in... Um, In Revelations 9, uh, we'll go to it in a minute, but I'll give you, well, let's go ahead and go to it right now. We got to go down to, okay, so here's the, the sixth angel, which is the sixth trumpet. These the sixth trumpet is where, what we're in right now. Uh, the fifth trumpet was Catholicism and Mohammedism. But the sixth trumpet, uh, that's a time from uh, Protestantism uh, that uh, comes all the way down until the church is restored. So... Here saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in great the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay a third part of men. This is the restoration. These four angels loosed out of the river Euphrates is the period of reformation. And here's the continued note on that. Let me go back right quick in Revelations 9. 
So I'll have this for our uh, post it. Verse 14. And 15. Okay. So let's put that in there. All right. I can back that up. Matter of fact, you got to do that this way. There. Okay. So that'll come up now. Yeah. Is it not going to come up on the 14th? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Okay. So the year, here's what I'm saying, and I'll I'll try to make these notes a little bit clear before I post them. But the year is 360 days. Just there's 360 days in a in a Jewish year, and which equals 360 prophetical years and prophecy year days are given as a day for a year. For example, Ezekiel, was it Ezekiel? It was God told to lay on his side, one side for the number of days they were going to be in captivity in Babylon and, and, you know, lay on his other side. And so, uh, he gave him a day, he said, for every year that they were going to be in captivity. So from, and I'm I'm saying that, uh, and I, I'll, I'll add this to it in just a minute before I post it, but uh, what I'm saying is, is that, that this 360 year period started, in my estimation, in 1543 which how I come up with that is, is that um, Martin Luther posted his theories, his theses on the Wittenberg, Germany Cathedral door in 1517, but uh, he wasn't it, a Protestant, certainly it just, it just, he just started, in fact, it had him, you know, got out completely, but uh, finally, you know, Martin Luther was finally rejected by the Catholic Church, and there was a death warrant put out on him, but God, God protected him. In 1539, uh, King Henry VIII in England proclaimed himself to be the head of the church, and rejected the Pope as being the head. And I've said this before, there's always been nations that, you know, rebelled somewhat against Rome. Rome didn't think too, uh, fear, they weren't too fearful about it. They'd just wait till the, it was a convenient time for them to put pressure on them to get them back under them. But of course, when this happened with England, um, that was more serious. It was a much bigger um, nation that pulled out, pulled away from them. And by 15, uh, let's see, that was in, yes, in, in 1539. Uh, in 1541, uh, the Catholic Church decided that we've got to do something about this. And so they started the anti-Reformation movement with the Jesuit priesthood. So in, in, I mean, in 1543, it was in 15, I think, uh, might have been 15, I can't remember if it was 1539 or 41. We may need to look that up. I've got it somewhere, but it's just been a while since I looked at it. But it was in 1543 when they started this anti-Reformation movement. And if you add 360 years 
1543, you come up to 1903. And um, so in the, those, those angels were loosed 30 days, 360 prophetical years, 100 a day is 100 years. Brother Leninger always said, he said, and it's true that you cannot put a specific, any one specific time on a day. The day of the Lord was actually 45 years. Uh, the, the, there's, there's different days. A day is as a thousand years, Peter said with the Lord. A year and a, a thousand years is a day. So, uh, but a but hundred years uh, works out uh, as the Pentecostal movement. Uh, it fits with the whole timetable. In other words, and I'll show you how. But so one day, uh, we're saying equals a, a prophetically 100 years. A month, there's 30 days in a month, which equals 30 prophetical years. An hour, a prophetical hour. There's 360 days in a Jewish year, if you figure a day for a year. And then there's 24 hours in a day. So if you take 360 and divide it by 24, you come up with 15 days or 15 years in a prophetical hour. That's how we come up with the fact that the last prophetical hour is 15 year days. I'm sorry, 15 years. So a year of Protestantism from 1543 to 1903 is 16, uh, 360 years. That was the first angel loosed. These are the same as those carpenters in Joel uh, and, I mean, in Zechariah. Uh, and then that was going to repair what had been destroyed. That's what these angels and the ref restoration is doing. Uh, then in uh, the day of Pentecostalism from 1903 to 203 is 100 years. And then the second year, the second angel, which is a prophetical month, is when the body of Christ was healed and, and is formulating to be a restored church. That was in 2003 when the body of Christ came together all the different splinters, God made it possible for everyone to become a part of this restoration movement and the vision that God gave Brother Souders. That was the 30 years or the month, the third angel. And then the last prophetical hour, I guess we could put in here, uh, is a fully restored church, last prophetical hour, seventh trumpet, equals 15 years, so we could put, um, two thousand and thirty three to two thousand and forty eight. So that's a uh, you know, that's a projection. I've always said I'm always fearful to really put forth a particular year. However, I do think, you know, uh, I think that we should have men in the body that are, I have enough uh, that are, you know, have the gift of a prophet in, in at least that has to be one, one of their gifts so that they can help us understand the future and the time frames. Brother Leger said, if you don't understand this 30 year period, you won't make it. <laughs> That's, he, he put it that emphatic. He said, God has to get help us to understand where we're at, what, what's going on in our, uh, in these last days of the Gentile world uh, to understand what's gonna take place. So, um, if these if these times and they may have to be adjusted, but the reason you see, if if you take 
uh, the hundred years. Let me say something about this hundred years. Uh, in 1903, the Holy Ghost was poured out in, in Topeka in 1901, but it went from there to Houston, went from Houston to Zusa Street in Los Angeles, and it was not about 1903 when it really began to be fully established, really well established in the United States of America. And there was two 50-year jubilees from 1903 to 1953 was when the body of Christ had the new experience at the campground. Brother, Brother Souders died in November of uh, 1952, and he was prophesying that after his death, God was going to do something special for the body to help them understand, I mean, to help them uh, and strengthen them um, after, his, after his departure, after his death. And so um, so the next campground meeting in, uh, in 1953 is when the new experience fell. And it went from the campground that year Many of the assemblies experienced that moving of the spirit that they had, that they called the new experience, because they didn't know what to call it. Uh, that was in 1953. Well, Brother Leninger died the exact same month in November of 2003, 50 years exactly from when Brother Souders died. And he was prophesying that we should have a jubilee in 2003. Well, he was looking for a, a you know, a great move of the spirit. Uh, that's what he was feeling like maybe it should be like the, like the, uh, the great experience that they had, the new experience in 53. But it wasn't after Brother Leninger, of course, was gone the next year, and I began to, and, and, I began to study what a, you know, what the Jubilee was naturally in, in, in Israel, which every 50 years, all your, all debts had to be forgiven to any, among the Jews, all uh, slaves, Jewish slaves had to be freed, all inheritances. If you sold your land, it went back to you every 50 years. So your land wasn't worth as much money. You know, if it was, if last year was a Jubilee and you're going to sell your land today, somebody was going to get it for 50 years. So it was, it was worth quite a bit of money for someone to get it um, that early. But if it's only five years to the Jubilee, it wasn't worth very much because they knew they had to give it back to its rightful owner uh, at the Jubilee. And so all inheritance had to be restored so when when the body began to come together when you know the all the different splinters uh the group the the uh, uh convention center brother brother goodwin's brother brother dl jones those people they're the campground brother and there were several different groups that you know, that this was divided for several years. And I do want to just mention here how that I heard men like Brother Clyde Patton, Brother uh, James Souders. I think the man that affected me the most with, his, with it was Brother Cornelius Mears. Those men, they would talk to us in ministers' meetings several times they would appeal to all of us brethren to pray and to be careful about keeping the right spirit against all the brethren that weren't a part of, of this group. And uh, of course, every one of these groups thought they were the body and the other group was wrong. Uh, but I remember these brethren were had such a broken spirit about the body being divided and separated 
after all, our message is, is that we're one body. We can't separate. We can't, we can't be divided. We have to stay together. Uh, and, you know, of course, this happened among this people. Of course, I wasn't here when it happened in those days in each one of those situations. But there's a, there's a history about how the campground, uh, many that called themselves the campground group pulled away. Um, you know, Brother, uh, Brother Painter comes from Springdale where Daddy Merle, who was the founder of that church there in Springdale, and it was a strong church. And how uh, that there was a group there that pulled away. Uh, what was the in uh, Oklahoma? His what was the older brother's name? Brother Mer uh, Pinnock. Brother Pinnock. They called him Daddy Pinnock. Uh, and uh, so there were several in the different these different groups that 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 were splintered. And uh, but. But God made it possible, it started in like 2002, maybe in 2001, but by 2003, we pretty well had come together. And so there's where I came up with that 100 years, Brother Linegar, uh, those two uh, jubilee periods from, from uh, 2000, uh, 1903 until uh I'm, uh, until 1953, the new experience was a jubilee among the Pentecostal era. And when Brother Souders went off the scene, God gave that. He gave a jubilee there to help the brother. And that's when Brother Mullinall, uh, Sister Mills, I believe it was, gave out a message in tongues on the campground. And she said, this is the... Uh, 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 well, she gave out a message in tongues. Brother Molnar interpreted it, and he said, this is uh, just a drop in the bucket of what I have for my people. I'm giving you this to help you move forward and uh, follow me uh, in what's ahead. And... Um, so I've, I've also, you know, the thought came to me a few years ago. I thought, well, what we've got ahead is the whole bucket load, not just a drop in the bucket. <laughs> if he's going to give us the rest of what's in the bucket. And um, so I know there's great things ahead for us, but that was, that was the first 50 years. And then uh, the last 50 years, uh, which ended in, in, in 2003, wasn't a great move of the spirit like Brother Linegar thought, but it was a jubilee where God forgave all debts. In other words, all that had been done that caused these splinter, splinters, God caused this brotherhood on every side to just lay it down, quit, quit trying to hold up a defense for whatever group we was in and whatever their forefathers went through that caused the splinters, um, all of those debts, it just seemed like God forgave us for those debts. Uh, it was just a little bit before that time that Brother Billy Brown got a message and presented it at the campground on forgiveness, that he was saying we need to forgive all of our forefathers and everything that took place that was, you know, uh, maybe done in the wrong spirit. Uh, that and maybe what caused some of these splinters to take place. And um, of course, several of us brethren, we weren't there. We we didn't have a dog in that fight. Uh, but I can remember. Listening, I went home one time from a meeting. Brother Cornelius Mears talked about God bringing this brother back together. They all had a deep uh, feeling that that God would bring this brotherhood back together, and they, they kept encouraging us younger brethren to pray for that. 
And I know after a period of time, one day I was, I, I would, I used to go in our spare bedroom when we lived in Midland, Texas. And uh, one day I was in there praying and it, it seemed like God touched me with his heart. I got so broke up about the brotherhood of all these different groups and this message of Brother William Sounders that God had gave them is, is like I felt God's heart was, was hurting because of the division and splinters, and it gave me a special feeling, and uh, I never have forgot it. I never have forgot what I went through in that day, that day and in the, the way God touched me so deep concerning that, and uh, so uh, all of the debts were forgiven. Everyone had an opportunity. If you was a slave to whatever group you came out of, you were freed from that slavery. You were freed to have fellowship with your brothers, no matter what group they came from. Uh, it just seemed like God erased that. God just covered us and touched us with such an anointing when we had some these services. Uh, I, I remember I heard about some of them were, some of our brethren were being invited to go to the convention center uh, in December. And then uh, after, that might have been in 2002, well, in 2003, they contacted me and asked, gave me an invite to come with the brethren to be in one of those meetings. It was a it was a great experience. You could just feel God's healing power and all of that. And so everyone got an opportunity to have their inheritance back into the body of Christ in its restoration state uh, that that had this message that was a deeper message than any thing in Protestantism or Pentecostalism and with a vision and understanding that God's going to restore his church and bring his people back together in one body with one faith, with one Lord and, and uh, one Father uh, who's above all and in us all and through us all, Paul said. And so that was the other 50 three fifty uh year jubilee from from when Brother Leniger uh when we came together that Brother Leniger prophesied in two thousand and three that gave us the hundred years, those two fifty year jubilee periods. So it and it works. Uh you know you can even you can even work it backwards if you you know if you take the church falling away. Uh, I, I know, you know, this is just something that I've been over and over and over. Uh, but, and I know when I put it out, it may sound, you know, confusing or just more than what you, a person can remember and just hearing it. Well, thank God that we can record it. We'll post this recording. But um all, all of these these numbers do fit. It, like I said, if you went backwards, if you take a 45-year period, which let me go on here before I go backwards, um, the 30-year month then would start in, in um, here, let me get back down here to it. This 30-year, uh, this 30 years, the hour, uh, right here, a month, 30 days equals 30 prophetical years. That would start down here from 2003 to 2033. Well, we're in 2022 now. So that only gives us 11 years uh, before, if, if this date, if these dates are right, I can't adjust them because they fit with everything I'm saying. I don't have any dates to link them to in any other way, but maybe God may show us some way to look at it uh, if it needs to be adjusted. But if it doesn't, and these dates are, are right, 
then we only have 11 years before the church is going to be restored. And I know you, you might think that's impossible. Well, I keep reminding people to look at when Jesus came to the Jewish world. If you would have thought that it was time for the Messiah to come and for the divine order of God to come in three and a half years after he came on the scene, if you'd have said anything to anybody about that, except for John the Baptist, they'd have thought you was crazy. And that's the way it seems today, but that isn't how God works. God has a time. He knows when, what, where, how uh, he's going to do things and, um, and why. And so uh, it's, you know, if, if, if in 11 years the church is restored, we still have 15 years. That will carry us to 2048, which would be, from today, it would be 26 years. That, that still don't sound like a lot of time, I'm sure. Of course, I won't be here in 26 years. Um, but, in fact, I don't think I'll be here. Uh, let's see. In 2033, <laughs> well, by the grace of God, I, I hope I could make it and see the church restored. But if I don't, well, I've got a hope of a resurrection of coming up. I, I, it might even be better for me because I'd come up with a good, healthy body. I wouldn't be such an old man. And uh, I'd have a lot more strength probably to finish my course. Um, so, uh, but anyway, so uh, uh, according to this time frame we're looking at, I didn't start this out to, to deal with you too much about the time frame as I thought about helping you to tie together the four worms of Joel uh, and the, the same as the, in Daniel 2, the four uh, different metals. And finally, clay entering into it, uh, being the same uh, dragon heads. And then in Daniel 7, the four beasts that, that all link together. They're also the same beast that's in the uh, seven heads and ten horns, just the three, Egypt, Assyria, um, let's see, yeah, the two the two beasts of the of the first six, uh, or the first two beasts are already passed by the time God starts showing these other four dragon heads, and he does he does show, uh, in in Zechariah he does show, uh, I'm sorry not not in Zechariah but in Daniel two he does show the iron and clay. Which, which ties into the seventh head. But anyway, all of these, these four heads, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth heads are shown in, in uh, Joel 1, Daniel 2, and Daniel 7. And they're also shown together with the other, the first two, beast and the seventh head in the 13th chapter of the book of revelation and the 17th chapter which i don't i can i may add that on here before i post these notes i, I didn't even have all these notes up I, I i finally had to quit making these notes i was trying to add them together before um well i think i had two minutes to get a tie on get a shirt and tie on for, for zoom tonight Anyway, so um, I just thought that I would try to put these together for you and, uh, you know, so you can have them linked together. I've never actually did that. Uh, okay, so if you go backwards, and I don't have any notes on that, but let's go backwards with the timetable. Now, first off, what we're saying is, is that the early church or the restored church will be the the combination of a 30-year period where it is, uh, you know, God's put it back together 
and now it's formulating to be a become fully restored and and then the trumpet's going to sound that's going to begin the judgment of God in the last prophetical hour which is the seventh trumpet so that's a 45 year period 30 and 15 so if you go back to the early church and take 45 years you know there's two dates uh, there's like 4 4 BC uh, which is before Christ was born because of the the date uh, changes and the way that the date's been set up. Uh, so whether you go with that, some people go with, with um, AD 33 as when the, when the day of Pentecost was, some go back to like AD uh, 29. But either way, if you add 45 years to it, you're going to go a little bit past AD 70, which I have said, you know, the way I've used it, it and it, this could be adjusted because we don't really know what start date to go with it. But if you went with AD 33, it, number one, if you go with the 2000 year world from, and I never, I didn't do that. That's not how I come up with 2033 with these dates, but 2000 years from AD 33 is 2033, a 2000 year world. But if you go with AD 33 and add 45 years to it, it takes you to AD 78, which it would have been a half year or the day of Pentecost would have, would have been in April, something like that. So you'd be looking at like seven and a half year period. Um, if that carried you past AD 70 to AD 78, that 45 year period, um, if, I know that, that AD 70 was the destruction of Israel but I know that it didn't happen overnight that, that the church completely fell away in an overnight period. So if you, if you just look at it to AD 78, and then you add this hundred years of the red horse Pentecostalism, it will take you to AD 178. And if you add 360 years to 178, it takes you to 538, which is, that's when the Pope gained control over the whole world. Constantine put him in in 325, but it took him to 538 to actually destroy and pluck up the three horns uh, that was against him. And it was 538 when he began to rule. And he ruled for 1260 years which went to 1798. So those dates fit. So there's your 100 years and your 360 years. And then what's the three, uh, the 300, um, um, uh, the 100 years, the 360 years uh, to 538. Let's see, is that right? Let me get my head on straight here. 100 years from 178 takes you to 538. I'm sorry, 100 years. Uh, it takes you to 178. Then 360 years takes you to 538. And so uh, that's when the Pope rule reigned. And so then if you, then, then uh, when the church was finally restored in 1543, then you, you know, you, you would go back the other way with 360 years. So, uh, so from the early church, you're talking about 45 year period, a 30 and a 15 year period, a hundred year period and a 360 year period that took you to the Pope of Rome being in full charge of the world. Then if you go from the time that Protestantism is established in 1543 and come forward with those same dates. Brother Leonard, you're used to, it seemed like almost every time for three or four years, 
we'd be in my airplane flying somewhere. And he'd keep telling me, Brother Smith, you've got to find me something in 1941. I mean, in 1541, because he wanted that 1541 and 360 years to add up to 1901 when the Holy Ghost was poured out. Well, I searched for that, searched for it. And they're just, you just can't find anything in 1541 that was significant that happened to the church. And I finally, I came, I finally came up with 1543. Um, and that's how I went to 2000, uh, 1903 established. I went with 1543 that, that, uh, the Reformation was established in 1903 that Pentecostalism was established. And uh, so that that's why I moved those dates to that. And uh, and then, of course, after Brother Leninger died, I saw that 100-year period uh, fit in those two jubilees. And what happened in 2003, of course, he was gone. But... I didn't forget what he said to us. And so um, anyway, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to give you the notes on it. I'm trying to make this, uh, I'm trying to at least tie these, these scriptures together that shows these same four dragon heads that God prophesied and gave different pictures of in the Old Testament pointing and in Joel, where these four worms are, remember, on the day of Pentecost, Peter rose up and said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And so we know that Joel's prophecy, his three little chapters, were fulfilled starting with the day of Pentecost and going through that uh divine order of God through that 45-year period of the early church uh, that we're, that we know we need to rest a restored church so that we can produce the same thing that they produced. And so, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking lately about what I've been saying to y'all about the marriage supper of the lamb and the bride. And I've been doing a lot of meditating on it. Um, in fact, I was just praying recently, asking God to help me to understand how better to submit to him um, you know, to, to really understand that we're in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ and how to better, you know, know how to really make him the head of our lives. It seems, I don't know if everyone's like me, but I don't think I'm too different. It seems like, you know, I, there's <laughs> brother... Uh, I can't know if I can come up with his name right now. Brother Everett Sugg wrote a song in Fort Worth, Texas. And that song said, it seems like there's two people down inside of me. One is uh, crying out to God and the other to be free. Well, he was talking about the, the old man and the inner man, you know, and uh, I really wish uh, Michael has sung that song before. I hope he will. Hey, keep. I hope he'll keep the words to that song, and we need it sung every once in a while. Because it it does it seems like to me in my life that I have had like there's two people inside of me, you know one. One is trying its best to serve God. And then there's another one that just from time to time can't figure out how to, to fit, its, fit into all of that. 
there, you know, you got to make decisions for yourself. And so or, or once in a while, it's like you got to move from uh, this relationship with God back into the reality of everyday life. And that's really not true. I mean, it's true if you don't get it figured out how to fit yourself into God's plan in every day of your life. And, uh, but uh, anyway, I've just been asking God to help me uh, to know how better to please him and how to be more, you know, I think there's some times that your mind moves over where you got to do what you're going to do and you kind of get to get your mind off of how God feels about it. It's kind of like, you know, this is a crude illustration, but, you know, like I've had people, I've had people like I sell dogs and people will say, well, I'm going to pray about this. And, or they'll say, well, if that dog sold it, well, evidently God didn't want me to have that dog. <laughs> well, I don't know that God gets involved with all of that, 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 that much, uh, you know, I, I told a person here not long ago, I said, you know, if you go to a cattle auction or any kind of auction, and there's an auctioneer auctioning, I said, you you don't have a whole lot of time to pray. You're, you're going to have to make a bid on that, on that, uh, whatever's being auctioned, uh, auctioned if you're going to buy it. So you need to pray before you get there and make sure you're, you're prayed up beforehand, you know, well, anyway, I think you know what I'm talking about, where, you know, fitting your life completely in relationship with God's plan, it, it, it takes time, it takes understanding, it takes knowledge, understanding, and wisdom of God to help us get there, and, uh, but I, I do want you know, my desire is to please God. And uh, so I want to be in, I want to be in a covenant with him where I recognize him as the head that those people in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation that John saw thrones and those that had thrones were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Well, I, I want to get to a place to where I'm not taking my headship away from the Lord in any way, you know. Uh, anyway, we are, I think everyone would agree that we are somewhere down in the end of the Gentile world. So, uh, you know, I don't want you to get too emphatically fixed to the dates that I'm given, but I, I'm trying to give us something to go by. And those are the dates that that seems to fit everything that I've, you know, that this brotherhood has, has helped us to see prophetically. So God's going to help to help us if we're going to make any adjustments. I might stop right here and just see if anybody's got a comment or a question about anything I've said, if it's not been too confusing. I'll give me a minute for that. All right, I will work on these. Um, I'll work on these, these, these these notes here just a little bit to make them a little bit more understandable and add a little bit to them. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I never have gave, and in fact, I don't know that I've heard anybody give it out like this, you know, as what's in Joel the, with the worms and what's in Daniel as the a man's image and the different metals in each part of the man. Uh, and then in Daniel 7, the, uh, the, the beast, the lion, the bear, the leopard, 
and the terrible beast, and then the little two-horned beast there. And uh, then if you go to Revelations uh, 13, I think that's pretty interesting. If you go to the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, um, where it shows that this is definitely John stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns on his head. And the beast, and this was the papacy, and the beast was like a leopard. Of course, the pap it was a beast. The dragon gave this beast its power. He goes on right here, see, in verse 2, the dragon gave him, the beast, his power and seat of great authority. There's where Constantine, the pagan Roman, Roman Caesar, gave the Pope authority and made him head of the church. There's no doubt God put it in his heart to accept Christianity. But this beast was like a leopard, so it, it evolved up from Greece. Rome did. Then its feet was the feet of a bear, which was Medo-Persia, and then the mouth, a lion, which was Babylon. So this beast evolved out of the three beasts before it. It had some elements about it that was similar, uh, similar to a lion, a mouth of a lion. It had a, a very authoritative powerful mouth. I think Rome was in power for like 500 years. The United States will only be in Rome, Brother Legger would say it only would be in, uh, it would only be in power for 30 years. Well, we're in a 30, we're in that 30 year period uh, if, if our time frame is right. And so the, the United States is going to be a short lived power. Uh, and, and because when it makes an image to the beast, it's going to give the beast too much influence and the beast will. And I said this the other day that I doubt if Constantine intended for the Pope to become the head of Rome, but he did. Uh, and I doubt that the United States intends for the image of the beast to become the head, but when it's lifted up that high worldwide, and then America's will be no doubt will be destroyed. God will take America down, destroy its uh, dragon power from being a short-lived dragon, even if it is considered that this whole 30-year period that America's definitely had the strength that long of time. But um so it's a very short period of time compared to all the other times. And, um, you know, the way that, like, for an example, here's one of the things I want to say about the seventh chapter of the book of Revelations. It started out with a head of gold, shoulders and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron. Each one of those elements, metal elements, were weaker in as, as far as quality is concerned, they weren't weaker as far as how strong they were. Gold is a is a much softer element than iron, brass, or silver, as far as that's concerned, probably. Maybe closer to silver than the other two, but uh but because they're depicted as weaker elements, I think you should look at it this way. The weaker elements were weaker while, like, like when Rome was in power, um, yes, and it was gold, Medo-Persia was a weaker element. It was a weaker nation. But when Medo-Persia got strong enough to overthrow Babylon, it wasn't weaker. It got Assyria and Egypt. It got several other nations to join with it to take Babylon down. It was weaker when the stronger element was in power, but it wasn't weaker when it overtook them, 
the other one. It wasn't a weak one taking over the, the more powerful nation. That isn't how that worked. Uh, and so I think, I think we ought to consider that. Anyway, um, so I don't think I need to say any more about the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation because we covered that last week, I think, pretty thoroughly. I hope this hasn't been, you know, too confusing. You know, I mean, it makes plenty of sense to me, but I can understand people that don't, you know, haven't studied this like I have, that it could just sound like, man, I'm lost. It, you know, I remember one time my brother-in-law, brother Cecil Ayers, he went with me to Tyler to, a, to a, we had a minister's meeting in Tyler. Well, it wasn't even a minister's meeting. It was just a fellowship. It was a fellowship meeting at that time. And Brother Linegar got up and preached, and he talked on the, the, the seals. And he spent quite a bit of time on the four horses. And when we left, when we left there, uh, my brother-in-law was very new at that time. He just received the Holy Ghost, hadn't been around that long, but I took him to that meeting with me and Sister Smith and his wife and some other people from the church. Anyway, when we were going home, I remember he said, uh, man, that, that bald-headed guy that talked about all them horses, he said he, he, he lost me right off. <laughs> he said, I didn't have a, I didn't have a clue what that guy was talking about. I was just feasting on what Brother Langer was saying that day, but it, it, it was plumb. He said, that went up smooth over my head. I can understand, you know, how a person that's never heard anything like that or uh, how it, it can, you know, I mean, sometimes uh, like uh, if, you, if you read the book of Ezekiel uh, in your Bible reading, it gets, you know, it, it, there's parts of it. I think the book of Ezekiel is one of the hardest books in the Bible to understand. In fact, I'd have to be, uh, you know, candid in saying that I, I really am just now starting to understand. Of course, a lot of it's just over and over God going over why he's judging Israel and Judah the way that he is. But there's a lot of symbols in there that are prophetical symbols that it's very hard to follow uh, what Ezekiel is putting down. If you, if you don't have a lot of these other things in the Old Testament put together in your mind, so anyway, I'm hoping that I'm in some way some help to you uh, in some of these things. Uh, maybe before we go home, we should have prayer. Uh, so I'll stop sharing. And um, let me see if I can fix my screen here. All right. Uh, yeah, maybe we could pray together. For sure, we need to pray for uh, the Ratliffs. None of them have ever had COVID yet. A lot of us have had it had it more than once, but they have never had it yet, and they are pretty sick with it. Brother Scott's been, you know, sick all week with it. Uh, Brother Al, and the thing about Brother Al, he 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 don't seem like he's terribly, terribly sick, but his blood oxygen level has been at 88 many times, uh, several times, uh, 90, 88, it's, you know, got up to 93. The thing is, is Al has probably a little bit of emphysema or uh, what do you call that? AOPD, COPD, is that it? Yes. Okay. So when we don't know if his level, we don't know if his oxygen level is, has always been kind of low because he's, he's, you know, he smoked for many, many years before he came to the Lord. And, and so, you know, he, he always has a little bit of a wheezing. And so we don't know what his oxygen level was before he got COVID. 
but I do know that 88 is starting to get in a dangerous place, you know, so we really need to pray for him. Uh, and then, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll give you all something to kind of cheer you up a little bit. <laughs> this won't cheer you up, but it will make you laugh. Uh, I just was heard about this lady today that went to the hospital. She was she said she knew something was wrong with her. And she went to the emergency room and the doctor finally they got to her and took her, took her in. The doctor examined her and looked at her. And this woman was 63 years old. And she, the doctor finally he came in and he said, ma'am, he said, I don't know how to say that. I don't know how to tell you this, but but he said, you might want to brace yourself. He said, you're pregnant. And she jumped up and ran out of the room, run down the hall screaming. And this other doctor, this, this man doctor caught her and said, ma'am, what's wrong? And she started trying to tell him. He, he said, come in here in my room. So he took her in the room, set her down and said, calm down a minute. And so she told him, she said, this is impossible. I got kids in their late thirties and forties. This cannot be. So he said, well, stay right here for a minute. Be right back. So he walked back down the hall to this doctor that examined her and told her this. And the doctor said, I mean, he asked this. He said, you realize this woman's 63 years old? What? How in the world could she be? What did you tell her that far? And the doctor looked up at him and he said, well, has she still got hiccups? <laughs> anyway, I thought that was kind of a cute joke. It's hard to hear it clean when you can tell nowadays. Anyway, I told that to my daughter-in-law. She, she she said that would cure cure you from a lot of things. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get back to where we're at here. Uh, So we need to pray for Brother Al and, and, and Brother Dave and Sister Gail. They're all sick. Brother, Brother Scott, Amy, she came down sick today. So they're all sick. And then Brother Fisher, you know, he thought he was about over him and the girls, but it seemed like today wasn't as good a day as yesterday was, maybe for them. And, um, uh, and Sister Chelsea's having kind of a hard time. He asked us to really pray for her. And so they, uh, and I haven't heard about Lyndon Stanley. They were with them the night before they came down with something, symptoms. So I don't think they got it, but I don't know that for a fact. If anybody knows, tell me. Uh, Smith, uh, uh -huh. that I know of my mom and dad don't have it. Um, She's just been struggling with her, you know, her other issues that uh, that the doctors have been helping her with, but as far as I know, they don't have it. Good. Well, it's good to hear your voice. I, I did get your text, but I didn't get back to you. It's kind of running a little bit late. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, we we just want to pray for all of them. Hopefully, they'll you know. Hopefully, we'll be able to have have church Sunday, have services at the church. Anyway, we'll just see what happens here, but hopefully nobody else is going to get it. But it seems like there's a surge right now, at least in our area, but I'm hearing that it's in several areas, several places in the body. Um, uh, I know Brother Sister Painter, we're going we're gonna to visit and their, her parents in Tyler this weekend, but there's a few people there got it and they're, they're worried about it. And so I'm talking about her family. And so they're putting off going this weekend. So we need to pray all over the body. Brother uh, Hugo Rodriguez told me there's several down there that's got it. Uh, there's, I've heard of several churches that's, that's got people with COVID in it. So let's remember that there's a new strain out. Brother Smith, uh -huh. Sister, Sister Hannah has it too. Oh, yes, yeah, Sister Hannah. So her that means her and Caleb both be quarantined. She's supposed to 
or the hospital wanted her to stay out for a week. And of course, with Scott and Gail and you know everybody in the Ratliff family and Scott and Amy having it, that puts us crippled here uh, at the at our kennel. So we're you know, of course, Sister Smith and I just got over it about two weeks ago. So I'm hoping surely we won't catch it again. Surely we've got enough community from having it that we'll be all right. But anyway, uh, Sister Hannah, Brother Smith. Hannah, how are you doing? How are you doing? Hey, and also the cases at Children's have more than doubled. Wow. Yes, and I'm cool. doing okay. Um, I'm doing fine. The only bad thing is that I was in Dawson um, before I came home and my mom came back with us to spend time with us. So now she's stuck here with us. <laughs> so just kind of, but she, she got it about a month ago. So I'm hoping she still has antibodies from it, but just kind of keep her in your prayers so she doesn't get uh, it again. <laughs> well, we'll sure do that. Yeah. All thanks. right. All right. <laughs> And then we want to remember Sister Crow, Brother Daniels, uh, Sister Crafton, um, all these that we mentioned, of course. Uh, my my uh, niece that has uh, cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, really needs a touch from God. Brother Gary Wright's doing better. He was able to take a a treatment and it has helped him get better, but I know he still needs our prayers. So we want to remember that. Let's just pray here together. Let's all turn our microphones on and ask God to help us during this time. Oh God, Jesus, we love you. Thank you. Thank you. Remember these days. Oh, hallelujah. Brother Daniel, Sister Crafton, God, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Fisher family, God, Thank you. Family, God, Thank you. Family, God, Thank you. Brother Scott and Sister Amy, oh God, those that have been exposed, God, protect them and help them, Sister Hannah and Brother Caleb, her mother, Jesus' name we pray, hallelujah. Thank you. All right, everyone, God bless your hearts. Uh, good to see you. I, I hope, you know, I know sometimes y'all probably would like for me to get off the book or maybe all this prophecy, but anyway, I'm I, I'm trying to stay on it long enough to at least exhaust enough of it that maybe would help you put more of it together than what you maybe have been able to in time past. Again, I will post my notes on WhatsApp page. It may not be tonight because I may have to work on them just a little bit to make them a little bit more to clarify things a little bit on them. But I will post the, oh, and stop the recording.